Guatemala, um, Sydney, Canada, <laughs> Ottawa, Costa Rica. Wow, lots of uh, different people from different places. That's really, really lovely. Las Vegas, Perth. Um, that's very cool. So, um, so the first thing that I want to say as we uh, dive in is that I started uh, developing nonlinear movement um, over 30 years ago, and I've been at it ever since. And it's still something that I'm constantly working on. I'm constantly creating new modalities and new applications. I still practice it pretty much every day. Um, we teach it as a practitioner and teacher training where we also have, um, you know, a, a program where people can learn how to do it. And uh, it's taught all over the world, both online and in person. And um, uh, it's something that I'm very thrilled about that we have managed to keep uh, nonlinear going all through the pandemic as well. As a matter of fact, before the pandemic, I only taught nonlinear in person. And all the teacher trainings were in person, all sessions were in person. And I developed everything that um, nonlinear is about in person. And then of course the pandemic came and I had this really strong urge to make it available to people in lockdown and in you know some really stressful situations. And so uh, it actually turns out that um, teaching as well as participating and with that receiving nonlinear in your home is super beneficial. And uh, it took a little bit of, you know, playing around with making it as potent as it is now in this online format. But I've actually uh, discovered that when people get instructed in the same place they practice every day, um, it really, really uh, goes into the body and goes into the nervous system very deeply and very effectively. So um, even though we'll eventually go back to uh, in-person teaching, we're always going to keep this available so that people from all over the world, uh, regardless of where they are, can actually practice at home. Something really good as well about not having to travel for, to you know, um, being able to kind of really relax your nervous system afterwards, perhaps even um, rest a little bit longer and integrate or journal. I see somebody has their journal open, right? It's it's a very wonderful thing um, to be able to do the, you know, the practicing and then the journaling and everything else at home. So I'm super thrilled about that. And uh, in these 30 years of developing nonlinear, it essentially started as essential channel practice. Uh, my first teacher was very, um, you know, intent and very specific about uh, clearing the central channel before anything else uh, was done in practice. And that's how I started. I would sit in a in a meditation posture, actually, and just move my body to feel where was the attention and where was the closure in the central channel. And I realized that when I was moving my body, I could actually relax or open or unkink or work with certain closures in my central channel. And then of course, I studied both psychology, classic counseling psychology, as well as trauma therapy and related modalities. And in the context of that, I realized how the nervous system was actually able to regulate and how the body and embodiment and this kind of movement can be used to actually really uh, release and unfreeze and um, give an enormous benefits. So while it's a very simple and very self-guided non-impositional practice, and that's very important, we don't impose uh, in non-linear um, at all so that the body's natural genius can actually do what the body knows how to do, which is release and get unstuck and down-regulate and open and find pleasure and um, have, you know, creativity arise from within. All of that's built in 
And when we essentially get out of the way with our head and when we um, teach the body how to engage with those mechanisms again, then uh, we have a very powerful tool. So I developed a lot of the um, trauma therapeutic aspect of nonlinear movement in um, actual application. I worked with a very, very traumatized demographic, people who had um, you know, multiple layers of very severe abuse, drug addiction, personality disorders. And um, so I uh, started using nonlinear not only as a modality in my women's groups or for myself, but in a clinical setting. And a lot of what you're getting now and a lot of the wording and the way things are, are because of the clinical application and me having really worked with um, you know, people who really needed super specific and very, very precise instruction and very hands off um, guidance so that they could just feel held and start trusting their own body again. And then um, when I um, left that clinical setting, um, I started teaching nonlinear as part of every single workshop I did and really refined it. So there's many applications now and uh, many different modalities within nonlinear. And they reach all the way from uh, creating interoception, meaning the awareness of your inner landscape, uh, to unfreezing the body, uh, release um, pleasure, finding internal pleasure and being able to source sensual aliveness and vitality in the body all the way to kind of an embodied uh, manifestation uh, modality where you're actually working with creativity. So uh, this has been my baby for many, many years and I'm super excited that now we are also actually teaching it to other people. When Steve, who some of you of course know, my teaching partner uh, came along in uh, uh, 2012, I believe or 13, um, he actually was the one who uh, really categorize it in a way that it can be taught. And he actually also is the one who taught, who talked me um, into uh, offering a teacher training. So we really uh, refined it into something that's now also being taught that people who have existing practices, we have uh, doctors teach nonlinear, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, the various healers, there's people who are workshop teachers who add it to their offering, and there's people who teach it freestanding. Uh, we even have a dentist who uses it for people who are very, very afraid of uh, being in the dentist chair. So there's many, many ways you can use it. Um, and of course, if you only wanna be a participant, which we're doing here in these sessions, you can also, um, just cultivate a home practice, which I'm going to talk about. And we actually have resources for that, where there's home practice instructions. I have some playlists um, that you can access. As I said, I'm gonna make this recording available as well. So you can remind yourself of some of the aspects. So that's a little bit of the history, um, very, very quick and dirty history of nonlinear movement. And um, since there's a lot of people on here who are brand new, I was going to just tell you about some of the benefits so that uh, you know what you're working with. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen here because uh, this is the easiest way to do this. And then you can actually see this. So here we have the benefits of nonlinear movement. So, and you can of course read up on this. This is all on the website. So regulates the nervous system. This is a very, very important one. And that's what we're going to work with today. We're going to work with the regulation of the nervous system. Um, releases trauma patterns into flow. We are working with a very specific nervous system um, aspect that allows the system to release, that allows things that are uh, stuck, either emotionally stuck, physically stuck, stuck in uh, the patterning of your musculature or movement. And we're using a very specific aspect of the nervous system to generate um, the 
ability to release. I'll, I can talk about that uh, later more if you have questions about that. Um, Nonlinear also creates high bodily responsiveness, which is really, really good for things like boundary setting, super important in boundary setting. If you don't know something's not sitting right with you because you're not really that connected with your body, you can't actually set the boundary in due time. And this is something that in the early years of me developing it um, was something that I really had to work with because I'd be in a meeting and things were said and I was just like nodding and smiling and then I'd get in my car. And then 20 minutes later, suddenly it filtered up that there was something I wasn't okay with. And so um, interoception, feeling what's inside allows you to become completely current with what's happening and then have action like setting a boundary. That very same mechanism also produces sensual and sexual responsiveness, of course, because for that you need to be able to feel what your body actually feels. Another aspect within the modalities of nonlinear is it unites mind and body in intimacy with physical sensations. And physical sensations, of course, also encapsulate emotions, which is down here, the processing and identifying of emotions. And then, of course, you can work with that. Uh, the opening of bodily, the opening of access to bodily wisdom is one that I'm very, very intent on because our body knows a lot better than we do how to regulate how to breathe, how to move, how to work the entire system. And so within this modality, we're really reestablishing trust between your body and your mind, so to speak, so that uh, there's a lining up of body, emotion, and mind that allows you to have internal, as well, and then with that, of course, external integrity. And uh, it awakens vital energy and sensual sensations. So that's some of the benefits. And um, um, there's, of course, you know, more descriptions will will give you some uh, links where you can read up on things. And of course, also wrote uh, fairly extensively in my book about um, nonlinear. And that's also posted on the website for you. So resources, we have like an enormous amount of resources for you. Um, one of the resources here is the nonlinear movement method page on my website, where you'll find an explanation, all the benefits and everything. And then down here, this is really um, quite important. If you want to start practicing, there is um, there is also an introduction here on how to do it, but there is time-stamped frequently asked questions. So in these videos, you'll see everything from practicing with an injury, working with pain, um, what happens if you start yawning, crying and release, you know, um, boundaries and um, how to work with boundaries and so on and so on. So down here, they are all time stamped. So if there's something that happens in your practice that I can't answer because we don't have enough time or it happens in your home practice, you can just access all these different timestamps and find answers. And often uh, there are several different nuances to a question in some of these different videos. So that's where you can find that. And down here, um, you'll find practical session information. Then you'll find the playlist for your home practice, which I'll uh, I'll do another round of updates on this um, in August when um, I'm gonna work with uh, creating a few more modalities. So you can always find that. Then here's a link to the teacher training. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. And then you'll always find the next session. And uh, there's also a teacher directory. We have a distinct um, nonlinear site where you can find all our certified teachers. So that's uh, the, the one thing that I wanted to show you. And then the other thing that I wanted to show you is this is the in-depth teacher and practitioner training site 
where you'll see a bit like all the different modalities um, where you know what's what's in the training um, the uh, you know the breakdown of all the sessions you get all the bonus material and then uh, further down here you'll see all the lectures and all the things that we're working with um, so that's all available for you and uh, you can kind of poke around there and uh, see uh, what speaks to you. Um, and like I said, if you wanna just do a home practice, there's home practice instruction on that page that I just showed you as well. So that said, nonlinear is traditionally done on hands and knees. And there's a few reasons for that amongst them, the, um, uh, you know, the kind of nervous system uh, protection and and grounding that comes from being with all fours on the ground and our front surface being both available and protected. But the other reason to be on hands and knees, and I'll give you alternate um, versions as well, is because we can actually access all the areas of the body that we want to work with. So what that means is the, you know, the face, of course, the soft front surface of the body, the throat, the chest, the solar plexus, the belly, and then, of course, the pelvic floor, where there's all these different layers that can be really nicely articulated when we're on hands and knees, and then the back body with the spine, uh, the muscles along the spine, and of course, also the area over the adrenals and the kidneys, and then, very important, the neck the shoulders, the jaw, where uh, we hold a lot of tension. So on hands and knees, that all can be very nicely articulated. Now, some people can't practice on hands and knees. They have injuries or they have chronic fatigue or things like that. You can completely and easily practice on your back. It's no problem doing that. Some modalities within nonlinear are actually practiced on the back to train the body for deep relaxation. Um, so it's always possible to just lay on your back. I would suggest not having a pillow though so that you can freely move your head and neck even on your back. You could also be on your forearms and knees. You can be on your side, you can be on your front. Um, you can practice seated. I've taught people in wheelchairs. So it's very possible to, to just do nonlinear seated. Um, the one posture that I would suggest you don't uh, work with, particularly if you're new, is standing. Because when you stand, particularly when you stand and move, the energy goes up and out. And we actually want down and in. So the closer to the ground, the better. And when people get very seasoned, there are some other options with standing. But as you get started and as you're really working with um, you know, connecting with those aspects of your body, it's really good to, um, you know, be grounded. So there's two golden rules to nonlinear. Uh, the first one being we are practicing with our eyes closed. This is a very fundamental aspect of learning and training for interoception, meaning inner awareness. And of course, if you have your eyes closed, you focus inward. If you open your eyes, you'll notice that and you can even uh, you know, experiment with that. You get externally referenced and you are going to start thinking. Um, like I said, I'm recording of this for you so you can review this later if you, you know, if you forget one of the golden rules or things like that. The second golden rule is keep one part of your body moving at all all times, particularly if you don't want to. This is super, super important. It has to do with training the body how to unravel stuck tense you know, sensations, how to unravel the freeze mechanism. So even if you are almost completely stable, just move a little finger or just do a little movement spine. Um, and like I said, particularly when you don't feel like moving, that's very, very important. Other than that, you can't do wrong. Um, if, of course, your eyes open, no problem, just close them again. If you stop moving, no problem. Uh, just uh, 
you know, start moving again. And uh, I will uh, guide you through the entire process. Today, we're doing a fairly short session, uh, but I'm still going to guide you through each aspect of it. So I'll uh, give a bit of instruction in the beginning. Then there'll be long stretches of just music so that uh, you can actually engage with your own system and you don't have to pop out and listen to me. That's super important. Sometimes people who are yoga practitioners are very perturbed by me not speaking. It's on purpose. I don't need to be in your head while you're actually practicing. I'll give you instructions as the music changes. Um, when we change modalities, I'll give you instructions. And then at the end, there's a bit of a rest period so your system can fully integrate. And I'll guide you into that rest period. And then I'll bring you up. When I'll bring you up, um, I'll give you some home practice instructions and a few other things. And then I will take your um, you know, questions uh, so you can interact with me uh, uh, you know, completely. So uh, somebody's asking, does it matter what surface you use? Um, well, I mean, grounding is a good thing, meaning being close to the ground is good. Having a mat that doesn't slide is good, but people have practiced on beds. And like I said, people have practiced on chairs and in wheelchairs and all kinds of things. So you can easily practice anywhere you want. Um, this is one of the nice things you will find out what works or doesn't work. I'm just giving you uh, suggestions for best practice, obviously. So I'm going to just show you uh, what it looks like and also show you the modality with which we are going to work today. Um, the modality we're working with today is called moving what you're feeling. And as that says, it's not moving your feelings uh, or moving as a feeling, it's moving what you're feeling and why it's so specifically that it, that it's a moment by moment attention to what's happening. And it's uh, a modality in which we're neither exaggerating nor trying to make something go away. And that's also very important. We're becoming intimate with what's actually happening without trying to optimize, right? Often we go, oh, I have a crook, crick in my shoulder. I must open it up. I must have it go away. It's not right. Or we want something really good, a really feel good sensation that we almost forcing, um, you know, the body to bring on. This is the exact opposite of that. It's becoming intimate with what's happening. And in that witnessing of what's happening and moving what's happening, there's a very interesting opening and a very interesting learning in that. So if you feel numb, just move as numbness, right? It's that simple. Um, and you're not trying not to be numb uh, or trying not to be tired. You're also not exaggerating numbness or tiredness. You're just being with what is. So I'm going to move back here for a moment and show you what this looks like. So I'm a little bit further away, so you might not hear me quite as loud. So I'm coming on hands and knees and I'm dropping my head. Always nice to feel what's happening back here on the neck. And then of course, once you start moving, you do whatever you want with your neck and head. I'm gonna just bring my head up again so you can actually hear me. So I'm simply moving with what I'm feeling right now. And what I'm feeling right now is a little bit of tightness in my lower back from sitting. And so I'm moving as that tightness. Like I said, I'm not exaggerating it. I'm also not making it go away. I'm just moving as that tightness. And as I do that, I can feel my hip, my right hip. So I'm moving with the sensation in my right hip. And that sensation then actually opens something in my chest. That's kind of more an emotion. So I'm just moving with that emotion. And as I move with that emotion, that 
kind of made my body want to take a deep breath. So I did that, but I'm not actually forcing any rhythm on my breath. I just allow whatever happened to happen. I often practice like this because I really like being able to articulate my arms and hands and neck and shoulders. So, you know, it might look very different for you and that's perfectly fine as well. You are simply tracking physical sensation and emotion and thought with your body's movements. So it's very, very simple. So in a moment, I'm going to take questions. There's a few things that I just wanna um, tell you so that you can kind of pursue this at home. So um, as uh, I said earlier, we have home practice instructions on the nonlinear page and the playlist that goes along with it. Um, I also have a short recorded induction to uh, moving what you're feeling on the embodied toolkit that's also there. And you're getting this, of course. Um, so if you want to do home practice, I would suggest do a song a day, start out with that and then work yourself into longer periods when you have time. I tend to do moving what you're feeling under the shower. Uh, it's always the first thing I do to kind of check in with myself. So if you don't even have time for one song a day, you can do home practice in the shower. If you want long form sessions, I teach uh, about four sessions a month. Typically, I'm just taking a little bit of time off in August, but there's always hour long sessions where I teach for a full hour where you can really immerse. And in those teaching sessions, I teach all the different modalities and combinations thereof. The next couple of sessions are posted on the website as well. It's the end of August and then going forward from there regularly again. If you want to really deepen into it, either by uh, really doing, you know, heavy duty practice for your own benefit, or you want to learn how to facilitate nonlinear, the next teacher training starts uh, October 1st. And there is a, a $600 early bird discount till September 1st. And as part of that, you also get free sessions uh, for everything I teach as a freestanding nonlinear session. So those are all your options. Um, and um, if you have any other questions that I can't answer right now, there's of course also the frequently asked questions section on the website, or you can email us. So Marina, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> Carolyn, thank you so much for the class. Um, for me, it's morning. For you, it's I guess evening. You're in evening. California. Yes. Um, thank you so much. I've done a, I've done a few of your um, classes, and I have your uh, Wild Woman's Way book, and I've heard I have many people who closely studied with you. One of them is Yulia, if you remember her, Yulia Ooh. from Vancouver. Yeah. He brought me actually to, mm -hmm. to you to me, um, but I find it, so I'm I'm reading a book and I'm identifying very much with the uh, you know the the issues why women actually come to this practice right a very dominant masculine energy kind of like very very many linear activities and uh, I do yoga and you know Pilates and I'm very much a doer and analysis and it's all in the head right and I didn't even notice how much I'm disconnected from the body but when I do practices like this and I try the conscious movement and five rhythms and something that is a little bit similar right but not exactly the same I have this tendency right away to go into you know I do the yoga pose or I will do uh, oh, I've done also so S factor because I used to live in Los Angeles. So I would be like, okay, this this is this is sexy. This is you know how <laughs> yeah. like over pronounced, and <laughs> it, it's the mind is constantly there as to what this is supposed to look like, as opposed to <laughs> turn it off and just do what it feels like. I mean, is that something that comes with practice, or is yeah. there also more tips to how to deal with this? Both. Um, so it's very normal. This is true for men and women alike, right? We have set patterns of movement. And that's not bad because these set, set patterns of movement uh, is what the body learned and how the body 
kind of orient. And so um, certain movements of a linear kind produce a certain kind of orientation and also emotional um, you know, disposition and of course also thoughts. And then nonlinear motions of all different kinds they they do other things right so it's not one is bad the other is good it's just whatever we do a lot of we have a lot of and the things we don't do a lot we don't have a lot of muscle so to speak mm -hmm. so it's normal that when you are invited to do movement you're gonna go with what you did the most which is linear stuff mm -hmm. so the first thing to do is to just notice that that that's your go-to and then just break it up a bit and not do the yoga posture and maybe make yourself move like really silly or against the rhythm or, you know, slow it way down or speed it really up so that you break out of these existing patterns. When you break out of the existing patterns, what's going to happen is whatever is stuck in the body that's being controlled by the linear motion will start bubbling up and around. And sometimes people get a bit weepy or they get even, you know, kind of like, like very strong energy or vitality or anger or things like that. That's fine. You don't gonna, you're not going to get stuck on those things either because you're constantly moving through them, moving through them, moving through them so that you can actually, um, become fluent in the nonlinear movement, so to speak, right? So um, the only way to do that is by practicing. The same way that you would practice linear movement, you have to practice nonlinear movement. You will fail on occasion, like you sometimes fail in a yoga posture or something like that. It's just a matter of sticking with it. And that sticking with it will allow you to create kind of a vocabulary, so to speak, of the nonlinear kind. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, you know, that just takes time. And uh, as to can you kind of hack it or shortcut it? Yes, you can by doing the things I said, which is move really fast or move really slow or move against the rhythm or move in ways that typically you wouldn't move because it breaks you out of your set pattern. So you can play around with that. Yeah. Yeah. Developing muscle memory for something new, basically. Okay. It's not in the Yes. Yeah gotta you gotta practice that you know that that muscle memory doesn't trust you can't think your way into a muscle memory <laughs> so all right well thank you i'll have you mute yourself and i'll lower your hand i'll take a few questions down here from the chat box and then i will go to uh some other people who've raised their hands let's see what do we have here What's the ideal time required for this practice? I'd say, you know, a song to begin with. Um, 10 minutes, like 10, 15 minutes is great. Sometimes you might only be able to do two or three. The, um, the, the key is little and often versus, you know, once a, a week for an hour. It's much better you do it while you're brushing your teeth or you when you're in the shower. Say I put you know copious amounts of conditioner on, so then I just start moving in the shower while the conditioner starts sitting in, and then I've checked in with myself before I do anything else. I also do much more formal practice, but you know I use I, I do it on planes a lot as well. Uh, so you know one song is fine. Fifteen minutes is great. Do I encourage sound? Yeah, I definitely say uh, you can use sound. Um, there is lots of um, explanations around how to use sound in the frequently asked questions section, because you can also use sound to bypass emotion. You don't want to do that, uh, but you could also use sound to access emotion. And if you go into the timestamps of that section, there's three or four very detailed explanations of that. Um, and that's, it's definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, I feel a sudden urge to cry. Yeah, um, you know, cry till you don't need to cry, which typically it comes and it goes. So the key is you let happen what happens, um, but you don't actually bring it on or make it go away. You just... You know, these things come and go, and they come and go sometimes very quickly. Um, 
and you're saying here, uh, do you, do I fully get give that attention uh, feeling your full attention? No. And the reason I'm saying that is it happens. You don't have to now, you know, move as crying. You just allow crying to happen while you move, and then you'll probably notice there's different layers of what's underneath the crying, or it just passes. It's like the weather. Right, it comes and it goes, and you just keep the body moving, and you allow for whatever um, happens to happen. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, good! Somebody's saying your your their body clicked in. That's amazing. Um, yes, uh, somebody's asking upset stomach, burping, stuff stuff like that. Once again, on the frequently asked question, I talk about every kind of thing some people fart some people feel nauseous some people that's completely normal it's just your system um working and there's strategies for some of that and other things you just gonna have to let happen like yawning for instance is really really good um uh, nausea often is directly related to unfreezing the system but nausea can also have to do with you reversing energy flow and things like that. When that energy flow goes up and out, it's like, ooh, right. So there's ways to work with that. And uh, there's at least five different answers and strategies on the frequently asked questions about that too. Um, what if you don't feel much? Sometimes you don't feel much. I sometimes have weeks where I feel very little and then comes a wave of something. So sometimes the stuff that gets moved is not cognitive at all. It might not even be very emotional. Um, you might not have a lot going on or, it's, or you have a very subtle system. So just move um, and see what arises. Often, and this is also something that, you know, of course, in longer sessions we go into, often um, when you don't feel much and you just keep on moving, the next thing you feel is actually a lot of pleasure and enjoyment and joy. So, you know, just just stick with it. Um, Tao, who I think is on here somewhere, Tao once had like an entire, I think, three months or so where she was just crazy bored like bored, out of her mind bored. And she just kept on going. And then there was a whole other layer that showed up. Uh, so that's, uh, um, when you're doing this with individual clients, would you be doing while they do the movement? Um, yeah, that's something that we discuss in detail in the teacher training, um, because there's different strategies for different clients. And for that also you need to like one-on-one -on -one sessions, you really gotta know how to direct the one-on-one -on -one session. So you're not imposing your ideas on the client, um, but it is a very, I, I work with it in one-on-one -on -one sessions and have for many years, very effectively. Um, groaning, moaning, absolutely okay. This is one of the good things about uh, practicing in your own home. You're not scaring the person on the mat next to you with your sounds. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so. Um, is there significance to pain surfacing during the resting phase? Yes. Um, what sometimes happens is that uh, remember, we were talking about nonlinear creating interoception, meaning interoceptive awareness, meaning you're actually aware of what's happening. What often happens is that the pain that is drowned out by all the other noise, it's always there, the body, you know, you're talking about a tight jaw. The body feels it and notices it, but you are so busy with and it's so loud, so to speak, out here and in here that you don't are not aware of it. And when you actually become aware and you become sensitized to the sensation of your body, you suddenly feel things that you didn't feel before. And that can happen. And that's really good because then you can actually tend to it from a place of awareness. And often when that happens, things can actually you know, dissolve and release. Um, 
Wow. Judy, damn. <laughs> um, that's the first time I'm he hearing that, but I'm also in my 50s and I'm, I'm still going strong. Um, you know, my body is actually quite vital. Um, and I do definitely contribute that to a daily uh, nonlinear practice. So, yeah. So those are the questions in the chat box. Now, Erica, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, America Hi. from China. And um, thank you for the session today. I've, I've always been like really interested in like to put into practice. And I listen to like a lot of your podcasts. I'm super fascinated about the method you're using. And as um, I, I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, I've been practicing for like three years time. And then like, um, I found um, most of my clients, like 10 out of 10, they have anxiety. And I found like a hypnotherapy working on people's mind has its own limitation. And especially like when people are having like physical symptoms caused by the um, mind issues. So I wonder, maybe it's a bit like a more a technical question here. Um, I wonder like um, when you work with clients, um, how long uh, normally you will see the symptoms go away and then they are more in tune into their own body and also their own mind. Um, yeah, like, so basically how effective it is. That's my yes. question. Well, yeah. It's hard to say, of course, uh, because we don't know what what other there are, how much trauma there is, if there is actual injury to the body or if it's emotional hold that causes physical sensations. So there's no, oh, in three weeks, your pain will be gone, right? We can't say that because we don't know what there is. But I can tell you that I also um, very extensively was trained in hypnosis and worked with hypnosis. Um, because you know I'm, I'm Austrian and it's a, you know it's something that's commonly um, addressed uh, there as well. Um, as a, it, it's a great modality for working with anxiety and pain and stress and all of those things. And yes, adding embodiment to it makes a huge difference. And so um, most people, including people who do home practice, if you do regular home practice within a few weeks, you have a totally different relationship with your body, right? Uh, that I can tell you how long it takes for certain things to unravel. I can't tell you because I don't know what we're dealing with, right? But people do report very quickly that their connection to their body and their ability to feel and their ability to um, actively work with their system in a very different way. That happens fairly quickly when people actually practice. But once again, you have to actually do it. You can't just think about it. <laughs> you know? that's, that's one of those things, but it goes very quickly. And I would certainly uh, encourage everyone to have a little, so bit of a practice. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. Thank you so much. Thank you. I said thank you so much. Oh, you now I can question. hear you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, no. Hi, Erica. Thank you. Okay, bye. You can mute yourself. Jacqueline. Um, hi. Yes, thank you so much. Um, my question, I, I read your book and I love loved reading your book. I read it a number of times. And um, one of the things that I really like is 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 this idea that it's it's valuable to be able to move from both from go and, and and to flow quite quite fluidly and rapidly depending on the situation and I feel like most of my life I've been in in go and now I'm like I don't want to be in go anymore like I've 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 done so much of that I just want to flow I don't want to work anymore I don't want to have to make decisions so so I'm like how do I get back into being powerful in go when I have to be um, without like trying to push it away that's a good question. Um, I would say in general, there tends to be a bit of an adjustment period where the pendulum swings to the, I only want to flow, right? And then very naturally, the pendulum starts swinging to the middle and you have both sides of the full range available, 
right? So mm -hmm. typically that happens naturally, but in that okay. transition period, it can be a bit pesky when you no longer get things done. So how I do it for myself is when I have to do, for instance, when I wrote the book, right? When I wrote the book, I only had about six weeks of really concentrated time in between our teaching stuff, right? And so what I did is I had practice for the creative engagement, which was nonlinear. And then when I got too spun out on the creative stuff and I couldn't get the writing done because I just couldn't make myself, I uh, do very linear stuff and very focused and structured stuff, including sitting meditation, which I'm typically not, you know, I, I don't do a lot of, but um, I, I noticed that it was like really good for me to just sit and center myself when I really needed to get shit done. And then I would get shit done, but then I would get too tight and stuff in the writing, right? And it wouldn't get creative. Then I'd go back on the mat and move my body. And I'd go back and forth during writing all day between those. Or I'd do a little bit of asana practice. And, and at some point, I was also doing a lot of squats and things that activated the lower body, but were very, um, you know, technical. So you have to kind of play with... Um, what makes your body focused and with that your mind and your emotion what makes your body relaxed and flowing and eventually you'll have everything available and you can just you know access it <laughs> perfect thank you very much you're welcome Jacqueline you can uh un you can mute yourself then hi hi so I uh have a question that pertains more to how you started um, so you kind of gave us the journey and that kind of thing of how you develop the nonlinear movement. And I as well am developing a new methodology of wellness. And so I just wanted to know how long it took you from the inkling of the idea of it all the way to actually putting it out there and giving it to people and teaching it, because that's that's kind of a scary process. It is a scary process. And um you know, I wasn't so intent on it. I didn't sit and go, I'm going to develop a new method, right? It was born out of my personal practice. Uh, and it was, you know, I, I didn't say this, there's, you know, there's some of that is in my book and things like that. I had some pretty, you know, wild things happen in my early 20s. I lost two of my closest friends within six months. And um, and so my body was quite, you know, like locked up and I had a lot of stress and, and fight, you know, fright really in my body, like fear because my closest friend died of breast cancer. And, you know, when you're 19 and you see that happen, it's like, oh, shit. Right? And so uh, my my beginning practice actually came from there uh, where I just explored for myself and then um as I, as I went through my training and I, I started working with very traumatized people and trauma therapy and I learned about the nervous system, I added to it first for myself. And then when I started counseling, I started giving it to my clients. And But all the while I practiced myself. And for instance, the reason we practice on hands and knees has to do with the fact that um, I had a very tiny bedroom uh, and I had to get into my bed from the door into the bed and so I in the end of the day of working with these super traumatized really really it was really horrible stuff I would hear I'd crawl on all fours into bed and then just start moving my body to release some of that and I realized what that did to my system and then I tried that out with my clients and then, and so on and so on, right? And certain things work, certain things don't work. And I still am developing actively modalities, new modalities. So that said, um, I, I had about 10 years of laboratory, so to speak, before it became the nonlinear movement method, so to speak. And then uh, probably another five or so till it had worked itself out and another five till we started doing teacher training. So um, my my words to, of, of advice there for you are um, very active practice and then give it to people as much as you can 
am, so you work things out. Till this day, when I teach, I make notes every time I teach on wording or things that I try out that work. Sometimes it doesn't feel that good. And that's how I've refined it down to the point. Like, for instance, you know, when you do teacher training, you get scripts. And the script is literally the best of the best of the best of 30 years of me giving verbal instruction with layers and layers and layers of meaning. And then I discard it sometimes in the session. And then I'm like, uh, no. Or I go, oh, there's a better way of saying it, right? And that's how I've developed it. Um, and so the last 10 years, uh, you know, I, I've been really actively not only teaching it myself, but also training teachers and training practitioners and stuff like that. So it took a while. But hopefully you'll be a lot faster than me. We'll, <laughs> well good luck with that. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll take Shelly and then we must stop because we're definitely running over. But you guys all have such good questions. So, and for those of you who have to hop off, of course, it's recorded. Shelly. Hi. Um, Hi. Really sorry, my video, I don't know how to figure it out. Don't I'm not worry. very techie person. What was it that made you feel that being on all fours was preferable to standing? Is it a grounding situation? Is it more that you're just safer or is it that you feel think that you can feel your body more when you are close to the ground? All of the above and okay. a few other reasons. So <laughs> okay. uh, it of course has to do with grounding. Absolutely. Also has to do with the uh, a very specific uh, mechanism within the nervous system that gets accessed when you are on hands and knees and particularly when your head is down. Um, it has to do with the fact that um, the energetic uh, movement, the movement of energy, I should say, in the body tends to go up and out when you stand, particularly oh, yeah. when you uh, hit things that have emotional tone to them. So perhaps uh, when you do your movement the way you do it, notice if you start going on your tippy toes or if you really start moving your hands, that's a sign that you are going out. Now, okay. for some things, the going out is fine, but for actually working and processing and staying honest with what you're feeling, it's not. So there's many, many, many reasons. Many have real uh, kind of neuroscience backgrounds. Uh, some have trauma therapeutic backgrounds. Some have to do with the energetic of movement. Um, so that's, you know, and it's that good to experiment in all different um, positions so you can start developing distinctions in your own body. All right, that makes total sense. Thank you very, very much. I so appreciate you spending time. For those of you who stuck it out till the very end, I appreciate it. Look for a, uh, an email with um, the recording and we'll probably also send you some other resources and all the links that we've given you so you can really dive in. And August uh, 26, I'm teaching again. I always make sure I have Australian times for those of you who are in Australia. Um, teacher training starts October 1st, early bird ends September 1st. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. Sleep well. Good night, good day. Bye.